and very much uh, look forward to her views on the struggles ahead. Uh, Ambassador Rahmani will be joined by uh, G General David Petraeus. David, of course, former director of the CIA, former commander of American forces in Afghanistan, 37 years uh, in the United States Army, an Aspen Strategy Group member, a patriot. Uh, also be joined by Ambassador Mike McKinley, former United States Ambassador to Afghanistan. Mike is a protean man. He was also our ambassador to Brazil, Peru, and Colombia. He was a senior advisor to Secretary Mike Pompeo before retiring from the Foreign Service. And I was very proud to stand with him as we were sworn into the U.S. Foreign Service together a long time ago, Mike, September 1982. And last but not least, my close friend, and, uh, Professor Megan O'Sullivan, Harvard Kennedy School professor, Aspen Strategy Group member, chair of the North America Group of the Trilateral Commission, author of Windfall on Changing Global Energy Patterns, and for this discussion, former Deputy National Security Advisor for both Afghanistan and Iraq in the White House for President George uh, W. Bush. Amna, um, Americans are remembering uh, these days, 9-11, the tragedy of 9-11, uh, NATO's invocation of Article 5, which I remember as the American ambassador to NATO at the time, the incredible commitment that our soldiers, civilians, aid workers, citizens made over the last 20 years. And I suppose that it's worth talking about those last 20 years because a lot of good happened, a lot of mistakes were made at the same time. And in Afghanistan present, what will be the consequences of the American and NATO withdrawal? And what will be the fate of the Afghan people? There's a lot to discuss. We couldn't have a better moderator than Amna Nawaz. Amna, thank you. Thank you very much, Nick. And thank you to all the panelists for being here. There's a lot of ground to cover. So I am just going to jump right in. Before we talk about possible scenarios moving forward um, and lessons learned, of course, which are key to those scenarios as well, I do want to talk very briefly about where we are right now. And General Petraeus, I do want to start with you because it was not too long ago, just a few weeks ago, where you gave an interview and you said, I fear we are co-signing to Afghanistan to a civil war. But you also said there was still a chance, there was still a chance there could be a plan for stabilizing the situation. This was just three weeks ago or so. Do you still believe that to be true right now? Well, there is certainly uh, a good deal that the United States could do to help Afghanistan stabilize what is an increasingly dire security situation. Uh, there is fighting inside now Lashkar Gah, the capital of Helmand province. There's fighting on the outskirts of Herat City, fighting inside the uh, outer parts of Kandahar city. These are major cities, capitals of major provinces. Uh, and the situation is very, very grim indeed. Um, could the US do something? Yes, it would require quite a significant reversal of the policy decisions. And it would require us going back in to provide intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance drones and close air support, all of which is vastly more difficult now because of course we've given up the bases that we had in the country, Bagram and Kandahar in, in particular. And let me just point out if I could uh, on that, but keep in mind that we didn't just withdraw our 3,500 forces, that re resulted in the withdrawal of 8,500 coalition forces who were doing a lot of the train and equip mission as we were doing the enabling missions, noting that, of course, our soldiers were not on the front lines and we haven't had a battlefield loss in about a year and a half. But that resulted in then the departure of 15,000 or more contractors who are the critical elements uh, in maintaining and sustaining the Afghan Air Force, which has got a lot of US provided helicopters and fixed wing aircraft, and also many other vehicles and weapon systems also US provided. So uh, not only have we withdrawn the extraordinary enablers that we used to provide, again, the drones and close air support, precision close air support, we've also then pulled out the contractors or they had to pull out that actually keep the Afghan replacements for what we have, which are nowhere near the equivalent of what we provide. Uh, but that even now is really in danger of being unmaintainable. Uh, beyond that, of course, they're expending munitions at a much greater rate. So we need to dramatically increase the supply, the resupply of those. So there are a lot of steps that we could take that could help Afghanistan stabilize a more defendable, uh, if you will, uh, security line 
but that would require quite a policy reversal at this point in time. But let's recognize how dire the situation is uh, and the fact that there are not just these 18 or 20,000 former battlefield interpreters who serve more than two years and therefore qualify for a special immigrant visa times two or three family members each. Now, commendably, the State Department has expanded a new opportunity, but we're talking about probably hundreds of thousands. And I don't know how you get them out at a time when the Kandahar and Herat airfields are being shelled uh, and ultimately Kabul itself is going to come under pressure. So, you know, I said in the beginning that I felt, I feared that we would come to regret this decision. Mm -hmm. I didn't fear that we would regret it as soon as I think we are now, uh, because again, this situation is, is seriously dire. I mean, the, the president of the country is now calling on the former warlords to bring their militias back to service to help the government forces uh, try again to stabilize a deteriorating situation. So it again, this is fraud. General, briefly, if I may, a fair to say a reversal, a policy reversal of that scope and scale, very unlikely at this point. I suspect it is. Again, I'm not in the councils of, uh, yeah. of war, if you will, in this particular case, but, but presumably so. Uh, uh, I'd love to turn to Ambassador Rahmani now um, to understand some more about the dynamics on the ground. I mean, we, we cannot underscore this enough, Ambassador. The Taliban have now, uh, by some estimates, captured more than half of the country's 400 or so districts. They continue on with their military march. That's despite public messaging that they're committed to a political negotiated settlement. As you watch all of this unfold, help us understand what is the Taliban position here? Is it is this an attempt to basically throttle the government slowly rather than just take it by force? Thank you. Uh, greetings and good morning to all the distinguished panelists. Uh, about the situation on the ground, there is one reality that everybody in the international community has come to the consensus that Afghanistan's war may not have a military solution, uh, except for the Taliban, I believe. And there are, of course, forces back in the country that benefit from war and continuation of that. And uh, having said that, it seems that the Taliban are just continuing uh, the, the war um, and they would like to have a military victory nor uh, continuing to attack uh, the centers and, and the civilians unfortunately bear the brunt of this uh, because they want to have that statement of victory announced. Uh, now, uh, if we uh, pull back a little bit and look at the bigger picture, uh, the war in Afghanistan that has been there uh, for over past 40 years has not really changed much. The nature of war in Afghanistan has not changed much. It's always uh, over power, and there are groups that are getting support from a variety and a range of the uh, regional actors. Um, and it is cheap to continue. Ambassador Khalilzad said that they, uh, we are, uh, the US is trying to make sure that it's not a cakewalk for the Taliban, but I don't think that they mind that rocky road to walk to get to that state, uh, uh, the, the, their statement of victory. And uh, the uh, one thing that has changed in the past four years is that the culture of war has deepened much more. Uh, that is directly con uh, fueling this uh, situation. Um, so uh, as I am looking at the situation, unfortunately, the current attempts to end this conflict and reach a settlement is not working. We need new approaches. Dr. O'Sullivan, you penned a piece recently arguing that this meant the withdrawal of U.S. troops wasn't an end to the forever war as it was being messaged. It was just a new chapter in that war. What did, what did you mean by that? And I think this is an argument that General Petraeus has also made. I think we've done a disservice to Americans and others by talking about Afghanistan as the forever war. Of course, it's true the US and its coalition partners and the Afghans have been fighting this war of one variety of, or another for 20 years, but the nature of the US involvement has changed dramatically 
dramatically over this time. And I'm not sure how much the average American appreciates the different level of commitment that the US has. So when we talk about ending the forever war, you know, we're talking now about withdrawing as the administration has recently done about 3,500 US troops. And that's in contrast to over uh, maybe 150,000 US troops that were there at the peak of the Afghan surge um, under President Obama. So we have actually ended the forever war. We ended it by finding what could have been a very sustainable um, relationship with Afghanistan to help the Afghans you know, ward off the worst kinds of possibilities. Um, and that is not very satisfying for Americans because we wanted to see a different kind of Afghanistan. We wanted to see a sustainable democracy and the kind of commitment that might have been made or continued to be kept by the Biden administration couldn't have guaranteed that, but it could have helped stave off worse outcomes. And so what I mean by it's not ending that uh, forever war is that as we can see very clearly already, conflict is going to continue in Afghanistan. I think there are some clear uh, choices that the US administration could still make to try to fend off the worst versions of a catastrophe. But the end of the day is that although we all agree, as the ambassador said, that there is no military military solution, the reality is that's been an agreement for some time and that doesn't preclude ongoing fighting because of course people are looking to change their strength at the ultimate negotiation table. So the Taliban ultimately, as Ambassador Khalilzad said, might decide that it needs to come to some kind of political agreement, but that doesn't mean it won't do everything it can to maximize its advantage on the ground before doing so. And that could of course result in enormous loss of life uh, for Africa. Afghans, humanitarian disaster, refugee flows, um, and of course also the possibility of the reconstitution of terrorism um, groups that, that could th pose a terrorist threat to others in the region and beyond. And that is the point on which I'd love to turn to Ambassador McKinley. Thank you for that wonderful segue, because uh, as we know, uh, Ambassador, the one of the key arguments for the U.S. was we went into Afghanistan to get bin Laden, mission accomplished. We also went in there to make sure that there were no more groups that could pose a security threat to the U.S. or to our allies. As the Afghanistan study group and other groups have found, that may not be necessarily true. Are you seeing a sense of sort of history repeating here, where we are basically seeding fertile ground to a group that could again host groups that could be a danger to the U.S. and its allies? First, uh, well, thank you uh, for having me. And uh, first, let me acknowledge an uh, interview General Sami Sadat just gave about an hour ago on BBC on the situation in Lashkar Gah. And I'm sure everyone on this panel, everyone listening, um, our thoughts are with the Afghan armed forces as they seek to deal with the recapture of the city. It's a very serious situation, as General Petraeus has pointed out. In terms of looking at this moment, however, I think it's very important to take a step back, look at it in geopolitical terms, but also look at it in terms of what happened over 20 years of U.S. engagement on the ground in Afghanistan. There's a strong argument to be made, as President Biden did in his statement explaining the decision to withdraw, that over 20 years, certain key objectives were achieved related to rooting out al-Qaeda and uh, killing bin Laden. But more broadly, he pointed to, and I think absolutely accurately, the world has changed in the last 20 years and the issues the United States has to deal with have changed dramatically as well. And they include the uh, appearance of new challenges from China, from Russia, new technologies, pandemics, climate change concerns. And we also saw over the 20 years, a United States that was so focused on, and I will continue using the term forever wars, so focused on the forever wars, that we spent $3 trillion, sent 2.7 million young Americans to fight in these wars. I would remind that that 3 trillion figure is what we're discussing now about the urgent investments we need in our infrastructure and modernizing our economies. We didn't win in any of the wars, 
And in the meantime, there were these profound changes in the world, which we now have to catch up to and respond. When people make the argument that there's still a terrorist threat in Afghanistan and that it will become more intense uh, should there be a change of government in Kabul, which we all sincerely hope will not happen. The fact of the matter is, the argument is for an indefinite stay of US troops. When for years we've been saying we've diminished Al Qaeda to almost nothing. And when the focus of terrorist activity in the world has shifted to the Middle East more properly in Iraq and Syria, and we certainly see it in the Sahel now. And I don't think anybody's arguing for uh, positioning garrisons of American troops through another half dozen countries to deal with terrorist threats, which are much more evident and much more near to the United States. And I would add that the negotiation with the Taliban, and there's questions that can be uh, uh, raised about how these negotiations were concluded, um, very much, um, posit uh, the United States reacting should the Taliban decide to return to terrorism. More uh, uh, centrally, it's been three administrations that have wanted to reduce troops to zero in Afghanistan, starting with President Obama. And the objective was to do so by the end of 2016. It didn't happen. President Trump came in with a determined agenda to withdraw troops from one month to the next. As Ambassador Khalizad knows, the negotiations were very much an effort to create a structure and timetable for withdrawal that didn't lead to an immediate withdrawal, which would have led to much greater chaos. And so the fact that the Biden administration has announced the timetable for withdrawal is in the context of what has been US government, not Democrat, not Republican policy for the last many years. And in that context, I would suggest there has been 18 months, 24 months, when the situation on the ground could have been prepared in terms of the correct military approach, garrisoning cities, supporting Afghan forces. But the fact of the matter, and this would be my second point, we need to take a step back and look at what failed. We spent, anybody wants to check out what we were saying about the war in Afghanistan, go back and look at the bi bi biannual uh, statements to Congress on enhancing security and stability in Afghanistan from 2012, 2013 onwards, every time we were talking about how the Afghan forces were taking on 98% of the fighting, that they were ready to take on the Taliban, that the Taliban was losing grounds, mm -hmm. that the Taliban couldn't uh, uh, resist the pressures, and that the Afghan uh, special security forces were among the best in the region. Um, and we were also spending tens of billions of dollars a year. So uh, the hard question should be, why are we seeing such a quick collapse? Where are the 330,000, 350,000, 380,000 troops? Why wasn't that focused on earlier? And so I think uh, there's a lot of questions to be answered about how our security support worked, how we described the war um, as it progressed, and I repeat, Every single one of those reports until the last two suggested things were improving and the Afghan security forces were capable of dealing with the Taliban uh, increasingly on their own. Um, and as uh, we look at reports that are emerging now of soldiers not being paid for months on the front, mm -hmm. of supplies not reaching them, um, let's ask what happened to uh, the graft, corruption, and uh, a, a misallocation of resources, which amounts to um, over $20 billion of U.S. taxpayer money. The final point, a lot has been said that no U.S. lives have been lost over the last uh, year plus. That's a result of an agreement negotiated in Doha, which posited the U.S. would leave and the Taliban agreed not to attack. Make no mistake, if we had reversed that, we'd be targets and our uh, mission in Afghanistan would be targets. And for those who say low cost, um, I would suggest uh, they meet with Gold Star mothers and attend services in the memory of 18 and 19 year olds being killed for a cause that's unclear. It's time uh, to uh, uh, consider this a real cost uh, in lives as well as treasure and on treasure uh, to say that spending an extra 15, $20 billion a year to support a presence in Afghanistan 
when we're arguing over whether to support half a million dollars and half a billion dollars in assistance to five million Venezuelan uh, refugees and migrants in our hemisphere, or whether we can come up with $1 billion for Central American countries dealing with a range of issues. Um, it's all a question of scale. I would suggest uh, reorienting 15 to $20 billion of indefinite support on the ground is mm -hmm. an important uh, decision to take. Thanks. And a number of a number of interesting uh, points you raised there. I do want to just pin back to Professor O'Sullivan for, for one of them specifically, because you were a member of that Afghanistan study group. And this has been a central part of the U.S. argument for withdrawal was that there is no longer a threat on the ground. And if we're talking about lessons learned, I just wanted to get you to briefly respond to some of the points made by Ambassador McKinley, please. Sure, thank you. Um, first, just uh, on the point about the Afghan study group and what we heard, this was a congressionally mandated group that met for about nine months of 2020 and the beginning of 2021 to prepare a report for the incoming administration on options in Afghanistan. And I would say, um, with all respect to Professor uh, Ambassador McKinley, that um, that that it wasn't a surprise, it isn't a surprise that we're seeing the kinds of weaknesses in the Afghan national security forces and the quickness with which the Taliban has acted. Some of the briefings that we received as part of that Afghanistan study group made it very clear that one, yes, it's true that um, Al Qaeda and other terrorist groups operating in Afghanistan have been massively degraded. I won't dispute that, but they also found that that was a direct result of the actions of the coalition. So so um, that's important to remember. And the other thing that really made a huge impression on, on me and others in the study group was that we received uh, briefings from, again, defense and intelligence people saying that their best estimate was that if the United States were to withdraw precipitously, as I think we can consider the current withdrawal, they expected that within 18 to 36 months that terrorist groups could reconstitute sufficiently to become a threat to the U.S. homeland. So again, I think that a lot of Ambassador McKinley's points are, are well argued in the sense that uh, uh, Americans will find, um, will be very sympathetic to them. I'm sympathetic to the exhaustion that Americans and others feel from 20 years in Afghanistan. And there's no question about that. But there isn't really a time limit on US interests. And in fact, I think we still find that we do have interests in ensuring that in the absence of a coalition presence, that those terrorist um, uh, groups are not able to reconstitute in Afghanistan. As you know, the Taliban has a close relationship with Al Qaeda. And as the Taliban becomes stronger, it's likely that Al Qaeda will try to uh, reconstitute itself. We know that ISIS has a strong presence in Afghanistan. This isn't an argument for a, a huge commitment. We obviously have a other considerations, but I'd like to respond directly, um, at least uh, there's so many issues I'd like to respond to. But one argument for the withdrawal, which I think um, has gotten a lot of attention, and rightly so, is this notion that America needs to turn its attention elsewhere. And I understand China is a much bigger consideration for the US, and I believe we do have to turn our attention increasingly to China. But I don't think this is really an issue of saying, if we leave Afghanistan, we're going to be better positioned to deal with China. One, we're talking about a comparatively small amount of, of resources, and I'm not diminishing any of the lives that have been lost, but just in terms of financials, um, the, the options that we're looking at now are not cost free. If we are going to have a military option of airstrikes from the Gulf, that is costly. Um, it's not as costly as maintaining bases, but it's not cost free. Maintaining support for the Afghan National Security Forces, which I hope we continue to do, which will be a key element in staving off worst case scenarios, could cost maybe $3 billion a year. Again, not cost free. But most importantly, that we can't pretend that Afghanistan is in a vacuum and that China isn't looking at what's happening there, that Russia isn't looking at what's happening there. If we're concerned about great power conflict and we want to change our orientation and really focus on great power conflict as we should, we have to acknowledge is that places like Afghanistan are going to be the venues for great power conflict. And for us seeding um, Afghanistan as we are, that actually creates more of an opportunity for Russia, China, Iran, and others to come in and actually potentially um, foil US interests. 
Ambassador Ahlani, I'd love to bring you back in here as well, because no one on this panel has better insight into what's unfolding within the government um, in Afghanistan better than you do. Uh, you served in the government for years. You um, are one of very few women in senior leadership positions, the country's first female envoy to Washington. Um, and I need to ask you about this because anyone who's seen the news recently saw there were some headlines recently related to you uh, of uh, allegations of corruption and abuse of, of approval of funds back in uh, um, the indictments back in Kabul of you and two other officials uh, alleging uh, abuse of authority and approval of funds to repair collapsed wall and, and damage at the U.S. Embassy. You have denied those allegations. And so I just want to get your response to them and also ask you, what do you think is behind those allegations? Uh, well, um, you refer to the Washington Post article, which lays out what happened really in that uh, scenario. But in summary, I could tell you that there were forces who wanted to get rid of me um, for since I was appointed. Uh, and they wanted to present a case to President Ghani to convince him. So they fabricated um, a lot of different things, including this campaign and the media smear. Um, I must say that uh, I somewhat take pride that it took them two and a half years uh, to really manage uh, what they wanted. Uh, but uh, um, I mean, they were also very frustrated that despite all the pressures brought on to me during the time that I was in here, I was not resigning. So uh, that frustrated them a lot. But what happened to me in that uh, respect is uh, basically uh, speaks to the fact that we are suffering. Uh, from immaturity and insecurity uh, in the Afghan politics, particularly uh, by some really high ranking officials. It's also speaking about the weak system of governance, lack of institutions, due processes, and uh, resistance to the culture of merit. It speaks to inflamed ethnic and deep rooted gender discrimination that exists. I don't want to go into the depth and the details of what happened. Of course, what happened was a embassy wall was bulged for 30 years. It collapsed and it needed to be uh, repaired. It wasn't a uh, regular wall, but a retainer, a retainer wall that, that was holding the soil, uh, holding the foundation of the neighbors from um, basically flooding into, into the embassy's uh, premise. And the decisions were made in Kabul and executed by the embassy based on the instructions. But what happened is what I described to be. General Petraeus, can I get you to respond to some of these issues raised about this concern Ambassador Rahmani's raised about an immature government? Uh, this is the government that the U.S. has said it will continue to back, is throwing its support behind, is saying there does need to be a negotiated political settlement. You also have this issue, as Dr. O'Sullivan raised, of a vacuum left behind by the U.S. as they leave. That government, those forces, all vulnerable and all open to uh, input from China, as we've already seen, to Russia, from Iran. Uh, I'm curious what your take is on that, what you worry uh, the influence of those regional forces who are not necessarily, have the, don't necessarily have the same interest to, as the US, though that influence will be on Afghanistan moving forward. Oh, and I believe you're still muted, sir. That's just one of many, many concerns I think that we should have in this situation. Um, there is no question but that Afghan institutions, the Afghan government, Afghan military forces, you name it, uh, exhibit all kinds of shortcomings and deficiencies. Um, the question is, is that better than what is likely to follow uh, if the Taliban take over? Uh, clearly, hundreds of thousands of Afghans think it is because they're voting with their feet. They are leaving the country. We've seen an extraordinary exodus of Afghans, which I don't think is much of a vote of confidence uh, for the Taliban, who will return Afghanistan to the kind of medieval, ultra-conservative, theocratic regime that allowed al-Qaeda to have the base on its soil in which the 9-11 attacks were, were planned and in which the 
initial training of the attackers was conducted. And as Megan noted, yes, certainly Al Qaeda is dramatically reduced, but in part because we had this fantastic platform from which to do that called Afghanistan. The raid that brought Osama bin Laden to justice was launched from Afghan soil and recovered to Afghan soil. It was during the final months that I was privileged to be the commander there. Um, and also with respect to you know, what these various statements said about Afghan forces, I don't think there was ever an assumption that Afghan forces would be denied the enablers that have been so critical to them. Uh, and again, that was the point that I was seeking to make. Yes, there's no question but that the deal with the Taliban reduced attacks on Americans. But the fact is that before that deal, there were fewer battlefield losses in all of our ongoing operations in Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, you name it, fewer of those than in the losses in training accidents in the US military. So we had dramatically reduced what it is. Ambassador McKinley is exactly right. And he knows firsthand, of course, of some of these deficiencies and the corruption and the waste and all the rest of this that has always uh, plagued these operations. Um, but look, at the end of the day, we're, we are where we are. Not You can go back and relitigate decisions about various other operations and a variety of different approaches and certainly could enumerate a lot of lessons that we have learned and, and, and sought to learn and incorporate. But at the end of the day, we were at a point where we had 3,500 troops on the ground, which cost us maybe 10 or 20 billion plus, including all of our support for Afghan security forces that gave us uh, absolute ability to deny Al Qaeda from returning to Afghan soil and also now the Islamic State as uh, Megan properly noted it, the Khorasan group is now in the AFPAC area as well. Uh, and basically to sustain a, an Afghan situation with lots and lots of, of shortcomings, but certainly far, far preferable to what it is that we are going to see as the country is now plunged into a civil war uh, because we were not able to sustain what I would have said was a very sustainable uh, commitment, again, in terms of blood, and that's measured in blood and treasure. And again, our, we, our losses were very, very dramatically reduced even before the deal with the Taliban. And the cost is dramatically reduced from when I was, for example, privileged to command 150,000 coalition forces on the ground. So it's, there's no comparison about what we had before and what we have now. And I agree very strongly with Megan as well, that what we have on the ground in, or had on the ground in Afghanistan is not necessarily the assets that we desperately need in the Indo-Pacific. Without question, the US and actually Western relationship with China is not just the biggest plate that you have to keep uh, spinning, if you will, as the guy in the circus, uh, it's bigger than all the other plates together. But keeping a small Afghanistan plate going. And I would also note to the ambassador, you do have to keep an eye on extremists. I mean, have we not learned from Iraq uh, that if you take your eye off extremists, and of course the big fault there was not us pulling the troops out. It was Iraqi Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki taking highly sectarian actions, but we did not have the footprint to enable us to keep an eye on what was happening as Al-Qaeda in Iraq reconstituted itself as the Islamic State and ultimately became a massive problem, not just for Iraq, but for Syria, the region, and indeed uh, our European allies and partners that required us to go in and to help our Iraqi partners and also our Syrian partners to defeat and eventually to destroy the caliphate that was established and now to continue to keep an eye on uh, the remnants of that. And I strongly agree with the administration's policy to maintain certain capabilities there, not combat capabilities on the ground, but, but the, again, the intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance assets, other enablers that can help the Iraqi security forces and the Syrian democratic forces in a way that we could have done, frankly, in Afghanistan at a vastly, vastly reduced cost. So again, we can go back and look at all of the mistakes and shortcomings and, and everything else that characterized what it is that we did uh, over the past 20 years. But I think we should have learned from those past 20 years in fighting Islamist extremists that you cannot take your eye off them, that if you give them ungoverned space or space governed by groups like Taliban, they'll exploit it. What happens there doesn't stay there. The Las Vegas rules don't apply. Generally, the US has to lead the response of a coalition 
And you have to do more than just uh, counter-terrorist operations, but we should do it through host nation forces as we have been able to do over the years, not just in Afghanistan, but also in Iraq and Syria and Somalia, North Africa, et cetera. And the key is to get that cost down in blood and treasure to the point that it is sustainable. Uh, and that is essentially what I think the large lesson is uh, from 20 years of this kind of war, noting again, the global context as the ambassador rightly points out has changed dramatically. Our focus needs to shift, but it doesn't mean that you can let little plates fall off their sticks because there are consequences for that. And we are seeing that now uh, in Afghanistan and we will see what, what lies ahead as well, which is going to be a brutal civil war. Ambassador McKinley, I'd invite you to respond to that with the additional context of, well, as love that the, as we all know, both of those wars, Afghanistan and Iraq, have loomed over the United States for the better part of two decades. And the Biden administration did just announce the end of the combat mission in Iraq as well. So what would you say in response to what you just heard from General? But Trump? the continuation of capabilities there, and that's a very, Correct. very important caveat. So, um, and again, I, I, I want to say, uh, uh, I respect uh, very much what General Petraeus and Professor Sullivan have laid out, and uh, they've uh, made very compelling points. Just a couple of uh, uh, issues perhaps I could add. On Iraq, um, frankly, we need to take a step back and ask ourselves if we didn't set off everything that happened after 2003 with a misguided intervention a misguided first couple of years there, which required uh, redefining our military mission in the country, which is when General Petraeus came in, unleashing a civil war and creating the ungoverned spaces that allowed the Islamic State to emerge. I would suggest also that as we look at the geopolitical context, our focus on wars and on terrorism over the last 20 years, this is not to relitigate the past. We took our eye off of the biggest economic transformation in world history. We took our eye off of shifting power relations in the world. We attenuated our closest alliances to include NATO. And that was very evident uh, by the time uh, former President Trump uh, took over uh, and uh, was in office. And we neglected our own needs at home. And uh, we saw that come home to uh, be very evident over the last couple of years in terms of polarization, the need for investment in all kinds of areas. So uh, to suggest that uh, the focus is merely material, I didn't mean to do that. There was a political and social cost as well to the decision to focus on the Middle East and Afghanistan, almost to the exclusion of other uh, parts of the world. And it's time now uh, to deal with the broader concerns. Uh, I do think that uh, as we look at uh, the challenge of a possible revival of extremism in Afghanistan, we need to put it in context. It's an argument that's been made by everyone who argues for an indefinite stay uh, in Afghanistan. And I repeat, uh, the facts speak for themselves. We're not in the Sahel with thousands of troops. Uh, we uh, have withdrawn uh, to a small presence in Iraq, notwithstanding the continuing uh, presence of much more visible elements of the Islamic State still in northern Iraq and northern Syria. And we can point to other parts of the world. So I would suggest, I'm not suggesting abandoning the struggle against extremism. I do believe repositioning works. And it also allows us uh, to strike back when and uh, if uh, the issues uh, become um, more compelling. And I don't think it's going to require another war, uh, but we won't know for the next several years. On the issue of uh, the Taliban, uh, questions you raised with um, whether they're serious, what they'll bring. Um, it, I do think that the idea that the Taliban are negotiating in Doha in good faith or were is just not true. And uh, anyone who's suggesting that uh, these were meaningful negotiations leading to a peace process uh, was engaging in aspirational thinking. And we're seeing now that the Taliban uh, have seized the opportunity on the military front 
but there's no signs of any concessions anywhere. On the issue of whether we're opening the ground to others, the Taliban, Mullah Baradar, has been visiting China. We had a delegation to Moscow in the beginning of July. Imran Khan is saying he can't do anything to pressure the Taliban on the political side. Uh, we've never addressed the issue of the fact that, unlike most insurgencies, the Taliban had a 20-year sanctuary to operate from. We've never addressed that fully. And it wasn't just a sanctuary. It was support supplies and the ability to move uh, fighting men uh, across the border every single fighting season. And uh, we still don't confront it uh, and deal with it openly. But uh, the fact of the matter is countries are already repositioning themselves. They're signaling China with their foreign minister, Wang Yi, um, signaling that uh, the uh, uh, looking forward to working with the Taliban who have an important role to play in Afghanistan. Uh, the uh, Russians uh, and Chinese, to a lesser extent, sort of indicating better not harbor any terrorists that can threaten us, however. And the Taliban giving assurances, Pakistan also repositioning. Um, and I suggest that we're going to see other countries doing so as well. We've seen the outreach uh, or reports of outreach by uh, the government of India on the same front. What I'm trying to say here is new realities are already being created, are already in place. And so the question comes back to Professor Sullivan's point on our places like Afghanistan, part of the next uh, balance of power, great power conflict uh, that uh, people are suggesting is the future of world relations. I would suggest they're not, and uh, that the key issues remain nuclear weapons in North Korea, uh, a nuclear uh, Iran, uh, the uh, emergence and how we deal with China, uh, in terms of our relationship across the board, Russia and the pressure it puts on any number of states uh, in Europe and our own economic and national economic security uh, revitalization. And I would suggest, having worked a lot in the Western Hemisphere, um, we could certainly use many more resources to address Western Hemisphere issues that are currently uh, being uh, sent elsewhere. But at the end of the day, um, I, I, I do think the issues that have been raised are important, but uh, there is a moment where you have to rethink this. A final point on the political unity in uh, Afghanistan. Uh, it's been very difficult for 20 years. Uh, Afghan political leaders have remained divided. Uh, it's significant that we have not seen a national unity call uh, involving all the key leaders of Afghanistan over the last several weeks. There's no clarion uh, rallying to President Ghani. We are in a situation in which Afghans, uh, Afghanistan's political leadership uh, also has to make decisions which can inspire uh, the country. And I would uh, add an anecdote there. Ismail Khan in Herat uh, has uh, fought in many wars in the country, is out there rallying uh, the population of Herat to respond. Uh, we'll see how that works, but it's certainly an indication of what's needed to address the moment and create the opportunity in the coming months to uh, reconfigure, reset, and see uh, where Afghanistan goes. General Petraeus, I saw you raise your hand to make a quick point, and I just want to note we're running short on time, so if you could keep it brief, I'd love to come back to Dr. O'Sullivan and-, and Just Dr. one very, very quick issue here. Uh, actually, on the way home from my three-star tour in Iraq, Sector Rumsfeld asked me to come home through Afghanistan and do an assessment of the situation. The very first slide in that briefing was titled, Afghanistan does not equal Iraq. And it laid out all the ways in which they were different. The most significant of those is what Ambassador Kin McKinley rightly highlighted, which is the presence of very large sanctuaries for all of the insurgents and extremist groups that were making life so difficult, all of that in Pakistan. And we did confront Pakistan repeatedly. I did this as a central command commander, the commander on the ground in Afghanistan, and the CIA director, um, and obviously it didn't make much of a difference. But the idea that we didn't try to deal with that or that we never confronted that, we confronted it and we confronted those on whose soil uh, those sanctuaries were located, uh, but that was not enough. And the fact is that, you know, Ismail Khan is rallying the troops because Ashraf Ghani has asked for this. Uh, unfortunately, I mean, we didn't want to see a return of warlords and militias and all the rest of this. You'll see it up in, in, in the north in a variety of different locations as well. That is not something that I celebrate, that these are going to be militia elements that will 
uh, again, certainly augment the security that the government forces are trying to provide, but this is another step toward a civil war. This is not just a transition. This is, again, a civil war in which probably millions of Afghans ultimately will flee their country, and whatever is left in charge is certainly not going to provide the kind of opportunity that Roya Rahmani enjoyed as a woman uh, in Afghanistan. That's not why we went there, but we should be proud, I think, of the freedoms of the institutions, however flawed uh, that Afghanistan does have. Uh, they will certainly not be preserved uh, under a Taliban regime, which again, I think will be uh, a very cheerless place to put it mildly. I know we have some audience questions waiting in the wings and Dr. Sullivan, I know you have to leave us a little sooner than everyone else. So I'll invite you to make any final comments, any final points you'd like to make. Great, thank you, Amna. Um, so much to respond to in such a good conversation. I'd like to come back to uh, one of the issues you raised about the lessons that we have learned. Of course, um, as we can tell from this conversation, this is still ongoing. I think the US involvement in places like Afghanistan and Iraq is, is still ongoing, although morphing considerably. But let me just take a stab at a couple of lessons that I think um, have become evident, although acknowledging that we're still far from uh, really adequately synthesizing, identifying, and internalizing the lessons from these interventions. Um, the first thing I would suggest, and this isn't a surprise, but it's certainly an important one, is that we all need to be sobered by the amount of resources and the time commitment that it takes to achieve the, the sorts of gains that we sought um, and our Iraqi and Afghan partners sought and our coalition partners sought in these uh, locations. I think it's very different than a lesson that a lot of people have taken away is that the US does not know how to do these things, that the United States is incapable of making a difference on the ground in these areas. I don't think that's the case, but I think um, we have at times vastly underestimated the time and the resources um, required. And I think there's a legitimate question about in our own own political environment in the United States, whether our democracy is capable of sustaining those. And another um, lesson that I would uh, offer has to do with aligning resources and goals and aims. Of course, this is, you know, Grand Strategy 101 is that you need to align your resources with your objectives. And I would say, you know, quite clearly at various points of the last 20 years, those things have been seriously out of whack in US strategy towards Afghanistan. And that what we saw in Iraq is that when you do align those properly, you can see real gains on the ground. And then lastly, uh, the lesson, and of course, this is just three of, of many, um, relates to the conversation about Pakistan that we just heard. And, and this is uh, the, the reality that the US tends to overestimate the number of things that are really under our control or our ability to influence. That if we look at Afghanistan, we, we put enormous effort into trying to affect variables on the ground in Afghanistan, when in fact, the ultimate success or failure of the effort in Afghanistan might might have well laid beyond those borders in places like Pakistan, where for all of the efforts of General Petraeus and uh, Presidents Obama and, and Bush and others, you know, we were never really able to shift Pakistan's strategic calculation, which was repeatedly the goal of um, multiple administrations to get Pakistan to actually look at um, uh, its tolerance of extremist groups uh, and the Taliban in its borders as a threat to its own future and national security. We were never really able to affect that calculation. And I think, you know, without that, um, you know, our ability to achieve some of the more ambitious goals, I think we're always going to be in question. So again, I offer those three things just as as a start on the conversation that is much needed in our country and elsewhere about uh, the lessons and how we can internalize them going forward. And thank you. Um, I'll be on for a few more minutes and I apologize for having to sign off a little bit early, but I really enjoyed this opportunity to be with you, Amna, and uh, to be with other panelists and with the Afghan Security Forum, the Aspen Security Forum. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually in Aspen. I'm maybe the only one who is in Aspen. I think um, you are the only one on this exactly panel exactly. representing Aspen at this point. Thank you for your time, Dr. Sullivan. I hope you can stick around for a couple more questions if possible. And Ambassador Rahmani, I will turn to you here now, of course, because for all the conversation around U.S. national security interests or Pakistan's continued support of those groups on the ground, no one is more affected than the people in Afghanistan. And I'd invite you to make your, your final thoughts at this moment before we turn to audience questions. Thank you. Um, 
So let me first uh, also respond to the remarks that were made about uh, the recent development, how uh, Commander Ismail Khan has taken on an, an Israeli young people. As somebody who lived this, I lived through all of uh, these things happening pa in the past. I would uh, also echo what General Petraeus is saying that on one hand, it is uh, a good thing that the people are rallying, that they are showing unity and support and they are saying no to the uh, Taliban. On the other hand, what is next? How is this going to stabilize the situation? What does arming more and more people mean? We are already an overly armed people uh, with uh, not much of rule of law. So uh, in terms of all the fabulous uh, in, uh, rights and possibilities that we have enjoyed over the past 20 years, uh, it seemed like the, the pendulum of uh, war in Afghanistan was continuously moving for the international community from the counterterrorism to nation building and back and forth, while the Taliban continuously kept themselves in the center and they functioned from that base. So with that, I think the options are really shrinking. And before going to, to what is left in terms of the options, I want to uh, also um, address a few points in, in uh, terms of the role of the region and particularly that of Pakistan, as you mentioned. Um, I believe that, that Pakistan has a huge role uh, to play and, and we wouldn't be able to uh, get to a negotiated settlement, which is everybody's desire and the only solution at this point without their help. But however, it seems that um, the uh, um, understanding of Pakistan of how this war would uh, go uh, has not changed. I will remember that 10 years ago, uh, or actually more now, um, General Ishfaq Kayani said that uh, one day Taliban will take over. And I think that Pakistan has continued to function with that assumption. Um, the other issue is that continuously in order to get Pakistan to cooperate, the incentives that uh, have been used um, have not been the most viable one. Um, I don't believe that uh, in Pakistan's economic development and connectivity calculus, Afghanistan's stability is um, a determining or irreplaceable factor. Um, so that uh, being always the focus in order to build confidence and to get them to cooperate hasn't really necessarily worked. And lastly, the incentive mechanisms implemented by international community to get the region to cooperate has not really worked. So where we are and what are some of the possible options? Unfortunately, I think the options are shrinking day by day as uh, this uh, uh, the situation deteriorates, the security situation and the results of it. So uh, I believe that we really need uh, to rethink the approach that, that has been adopted towards Afghanistan, the solutions that has not worked and have been tried in the past are probably not going to work in the future either. So uh, the, the options, unfortunately, are very limited. One is, is the world really ready to step on, uh, on the side and watch what happens, which would be a human catastrophe. Right now, there is over 20 million people at the verge of starvation. 270,000 people have been displaced since the beginning of just 2021. Um, the other option would be to adopt a really hands-on approach by international community to try to negotiate a settlement. When I say hands-on, they have to be involved. You can't just leave it that the for, for the same term that uh, that it has to be uh, uh, Afghan-led and Afghan-owned, which is important to be, it, which is important that it would be, uh, the, the, the Afghan should be making the decision, but there should be a lot more international involvement to make it happen and make it happen soon before it's too late. And then to also establish forces to sustain uh, the agreement, whether it takes peacekeeping forces or whatever it is. Thank you very much for that, Ambassador Rahmani. And I apologize to our audience members. I've kept waiting. I know we have a few waiting in the wings with their questions now. Uh, I believe, actually, Ambassador Burns has joined us again. Maybe we don't have time for questions. I'll turn it over to you. 
Amna, we have three minutes. Please, please proceed. Wonderful. I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe Farah Pandit is with us and has a question for the panel. There she is now. I'll turn it over to you, Farah. Uh, good afternoon, and it's a pleasure to be with all of you. Uh, I wanted to pull the thread on the issues of extremism and ideology alongside with Pakistan. Uh, and I'm wondering if we're looking, this panel is about lessons learned and, and what we should be doing is also thinking about how to build a strategy that you, that you look around the corner. So here's my question. Um, what should the United States be doing as we think about the ideology that the Taliban is spreading, um, whether it's in the form of um, their particular kind of extremism or AQ or ISIS, this isn't going away and ideology has no borders. So my question is what should we be doing now as we think about the threat for the future? Would like to take that first. I'd be happy to take it uh, because I actually think that this is something that the administration is quite keenly focused on. Uh, in announcing the withdrawal, uh, President Biden was very clear that of the potential return of Al Qaeda, like Ambassador McKinley, I don't think that Al Qaeda, even if it re re is re able to reestablish a sanctuary in Afghanistan, is going to be a threat to our homeland anytime soon. But given time, that could be problematic. And I think the administration rightly, uh, the military and uh, CIA and others are riveted on ensuring that we identify any emergence of some kind of extremist sanctuary. Uh, and then we will take appropriate steps to disrupt and degrade it uh, and destroy it if we can, noting that of course it will be much more costly to do this from bases in Qatar and the UAE or off an aircraft carrier uh, than it was to do it from bases in Afghanistan. And maybe if I can, I might just offer my final comment as well. Um, you know, you noted at the beginning of this session that um, I said when the decision to withdraw was announced that I feared that we had consigned Afghanistan to a brutal civil war. And frankly, I am deeply saddened that that assessment uh, appears to be validated or being validated because and all because, again, we could not sustain what I think was quite a sustainable commitment and similar to that which we have uh, in other places around the world. And with great respect in the Sahel, if you aggregate all the forces that we have there, I think you would find it, it is very close to a thousand, uh, if, if not about that number. So I think the biggest lesson of all of this is that you have to have a sustained, sustainable commitment to keep an eye on extremists even as we rightly refocus, rebalance, and uh, emphasize the issues involving the US and Western relationship with China vastly more than all of these put together. But you do have to keep these smaller plates spinning even as you keep that big plate spinning. And thank you again, Amna, and thanks to my uh, fellow panelists, uh, to the ambassador and to the former ambassador. Thank you. Thank you, General Petraeus. And I believe I am up against the clock here. So Ambassador Burns, I think we probably don't have time for one more question. Unfortunately, we don't. I wish we did. But I want to thank Hamna Nawaz for leading this very honest, open, very frank, I would say difficult and important discussion. Thank you to Ambassador Rahmani, to General Petraeus, to Ambassador Mike McKinley, to Professor Megan O'Sullivan. I must say I'm left with a strong feeling of how tragic this situation is for the Afghan people and for the United States. Tragic for all of us uh, who work to bring peace to that country. Tragic to see the return of a despicable group like the Taliban. And I guess I'm just left with a difficult question. What can we Americans do to help those Afghans who are loyal to us and to help them uh, live a life of security and freedom in our country if that's what they choose to do? We're talking about the thousands of people that Mike McKinley talked about at the very beginning. So um, thank you to all of you for this important discussion. We will continue this. And Aspen, and I'm going to thank you again. We're now going to turn to another important discussion on a very different subject.